Hello, everyone, then. So I'm Joao. Most of you know me. For those who don't, I work in the 2Chain team with Michael Matz. So uh, this is a project we have been working for a year now. We, we have been trying to implement uh, user space live patching, or at least to prototype it in a way that uh, it can become a product at some point. So uh, I'm going to basically talk about the advances we had uh, throughout this last year because I presented a very uh, initial version of this prototype in the last labs conference, perhaps someone remembers. So uh, I'll just start with the basics for those who are not like really aware about live patching. So when we're talking about live patching, we are basically talking about fixing bad code without having to restart your software. So basically what we are trying to avoid is downtime. It's already a thing in the kernel. So as, as uh, Neo mentioned yesterday uh, during his quick talk, this is probably one of the most successful products within the company uh, in these last years. So this is something that already happens. We have products being shipped with that. So uh, you can actually fix kernel code without having to reboot machines, which is very nice. And it's soon to be a thing in the user space. So what we want to do is that we want to provide this same kind of feature for the user space applications. So uh, basically, live patching has a function granularity. So uh, when you're patching code, you are basically replacing bad functions for fixed functions. And uh, what the way it, it normally happens, uh, you put detours uh, in the prolog of functions just to replace them. So for example, here we have this example where I have the foo function, which is somewhat a bad function. And eventually, you live patch it. So what, what you do is that you put a jump instruction in the beginning of the foo function, calling to its new version, so, so jumping to its new version. So uh, basically, whenever foo is going to be called by the, the process or the kernel or whatever, uh, what's going to happen is that it will actually jump into its new version, and then uh, you're going to have fixed code running. So uh, one thing which is assumed uh, for live patching is that it must be consistent. So basically, it must be applied atomically, what means that if you are patching, let's say, a set of 10 functions, you must patch these all 10 functions at once. So you cannot have a state where you have like five functions which were patched and five functions which were not patched. You, you definitely don't want to do that. And also, uh, you must ensure that these functions which are being patched, they are not active. Basically, because let's say if you have a function which is running but called another function, so it's on the stack, uh, to, to be executed when, when control flow returns to it. Uh, and you eventually patch this function, so when it returns, it's going to be running its, its older version. And that's not something that you want to do, that you want to happen, right? So uh, these are like basic constraints that you need to follow to have like a consistent, consistent live patching. So uh, how people do it in the kernel? Uh, there are basically uh, two flavors. Uh, perhaps the kernel guys have something else. Uh, I haven't been following it closely, but uh, the flavors which I know basically are stack tracing. Uh, basically, you just look at the stack and figure out uh, which are the functions which are running. And based on that, you know what can be patched and what cannot be patched. And the other thing is creating boundaries between user space and kernel space. So basically, you know that if all threads in the system are in user space, this means that no kernel code is running, so it's actually safe to, to patch the kernel. Uh, and, and you can proceed with that. So uh, can these schemes be used uh, in user space? Can we just follow that? Well, of course, no, right? And that's a big no. So first thing is that we don't have like a reliable stack tracer for user space. So uh, there's not, I mean, in the kernel now, they have uh, something called ORC, but that has not been ported into user space yet. And we are not sure if it's even doable. So uh, what, what happens is that uh, you cannot just like Assume that we are going to look at the stack and figure out that it's safe to say that the given set of functions is running or not. So you can even do stack tracing, but it's not like 100% reliable. So for a product which wants to prevent downtime, this might not be the, the, the best way to go. And uh, except for that, I mean, threads are never only in kernel space, right? So uh, as I said before, you can assume that if all threads are in the user space, they are not in kernel space, so you can patch kernel. Uh, the other way around is not true, right? I mean, kernels, I mean, threads are always like in user space somehow. So uh, you cannot, if, if, the, if the threads are all like in kernel space, uh, this means that you have no processes in user space, so you don't have anything to patch, right? 
So uh, we have been dealing uh, with this problem for a while. As I said, uh, since I started uh, with the company, we started working on this problem. Last year, we presented something. So let's get back in time a little bit, and I'm going to show uh, how we reached the, the model which we, we currently are working on. So previously on user space live patching, we had this that we called libulp. So uh, it was a user space uh, live patching library. It was presented in the last labs conference. It had a checkpoint based consistency. Uh, basically, what, what's this uh, checkpoint based consistency? We, the user would need to add checkpoints to the source code. So basically, it would like get a function which is like frequently executed by his process and would modify this function by adding uh, a function there, which is the checkpoint. So basically, what this checkpoint would, would do was checking if there was a patch to be applied. And since the user knows where this function is, uh, he would be able to infer if it was safe or not to patch a given set, set of functions or no. So uh, this is a good idea, right? No, not at all. This is like a very bad idea indeed. Uh, basically, uh, it requires source code changes. So if you want to have live patching in your application, you would have to change uh, your application and you don't want to do that. It's unsuitable for multi-threading. So if you have checkpoints, uh, in, you, you, you need all threads to be in a checkpoint so you can apply the live patch. And uh, it would lead to a situation where one thread would need to wait for another one. And this could get messy. And especially, it would lead to deadlocks. And uh, it relies on user's knowledge about the source code, right? So the user has to know that if the checkpoint is in a function A, he cannot patch the function A. And he cannot patch the functions, which eventually might be calling the function A. So he needs to know a little bit about the call graph of the application to define if it's like right or not to apply that given patch through a given checkpoint. And come on, it's a terrible idea. It would never work as a project. So uh, we went back to brainstorms. We had some discussions with uh, Wojciak, ERG. Many people contributed here, uh, Libor. And uh, we realized that patching applications was not like the real target of what we are doing. I mean, applications are fine to patch. It would be great. But the fact is that at least 90% of the vulnerabilities are in libraries. So the real deal that we want to reach is to have like uh, patchable libraries. So for example, glibc or libssl, are the two main targets that we are focusing right now. And uh, that's exactly what we want to patch. So uh, we came to, to this new idea, which would be like having library boundary based patching. So similarly to what's done in the kernel, you can isolate kernel space from user space. What we started doing is like isolating the application space from the library space. So basically, what we do is that we try to track uh, the application context, the application execution, and figure out if it's inside the library. If it's not inside that library, this means that we can patch it safely. So uh, OK, that's an interesting idea. But how do you do to track this uh, interlibrary context? Our first idea would be to use modified PLTs. So uh, PLT is a table uh, which is used to call uh, dynamically linked functions. So whenever you are calling a function from a library, you will go through the PLT. So control flow will go there. So our idea was to uh, modify this PLT in a way that it would call some, some code uh, that we would put there. And this code would allow us to track uh, the execution of your, of your application. So nice idea, right? Uh, not at all again. Why is that? Because Tracking through the PLT is actually the bad perspective to solve this problem. The PLT actually tells you when your control flow is exiting an object and going to another one. And we don't actually want to track when the control flow is exiting an object. We want to know when it's entering another one. So basically, if you want to track if the code is inside glibc or not, for example, you would, you would need like all the PLTs in your process patched. So whenever somebody calls a function from uh, glibc, uh, you would know it, right? So this would be like very complicated to very to, to have like a system where all PLTs would have to be modified and patched. So uh, we considered this to not be the best idea. We started, we continued like pursuing something, and eventually we reached uh, what we called libpulp. The P doesn't mean much; it's just like it sounds better. So libpulp is, is much better than libulp. So uh, what, what's our new idea? So basically, our, our idea is to modify the library entry points uh, to go through ULP stubs. So ULP stubs is this code, which I mentioned, that is going to uh, track control flow, right? 
So uh, our idea is basically to go to the binary and change the dynamic symbols table. So we are basically cheating the linker here, the dynamic linker. So whenever the dynamic linker is trying to resolve the address of a given symbol or function, so your application can call it, since we have modified the dynamic symbols table, it's going to resolve that address to something that we want and not to the actual function. And by doing that, we can make uh, our code execute before uh, the function, the, the, the library is actually entered. So uh, as I said, the symbols are resolved to entries, entries in a trampoline table. So for each uh, exported function, we have like an entry in this table, this trampoline table. And uh, this trampoline table is generated by the linker. So notice that we still, we still need to have some kind of special preparation with the library here. So we are using like a, a special linker for generating this, but it's much better than, the, than our original approach because the user doesn't actually have to change the source code. It's just like a, a linker level uh, modification. Uh, so these ULP stubs, which I mentioned, they're like very tiny code snippets. So uh, just like uh, functions implemented in assembly, uh, just less than 100 uh, lines of code. Uh, it's, they're provided by the libpulp, so they will come with libpulp and uh, you can just link them into your, your uh, into your, uh, your library. Uh, as I said, it's just like a linker level modification. And uh, we have basically two functions, which are ULP entry and ULP exit, and let's see how it works. So uh, you have the trampoline, which uh, your, your code will go through uh, whenever you are uh, calling a function in that library. So the first thing that uh, the trampoline will do is call the ULP entry. So we have this shadow stack here which is not really a shadow stack, it's actually a shadow variable or something like that. If, this, if, if it's not set, so if it's zero, uh, we are going to save the return address of the function that we are calling into, into, into this, our shadow stack, and then we are going to replace the return address with the address of our other function, the ULP exit. Uh, it's gonna be clear why we do that soon. And then it's gonna return and execute the function regularly. So uh, when that function is, is, is finished, when it's returning, what's going to happen is that it's going to go through the ULP exit, and the ULP exit will actually just put the shadow stack address, uh, which is the original address for that function, into a scratch, then it will unset the shadow stack, and then it will jump uh, to the original return address. The thing that we're doing here is that we are actually using this shadow stack uh, variable as uh, a flag. So if this is null, this means that uh, this library is not entered. If this, is, if this has a value which is different than null, this means that code inside this library, this library is running. So uh, just to give a bigger picture here, so we have this function main calling a function foo. So it basically goes through uh, its PLT. As we have cheated the linker, the linker will resolve uh, the address of foo to the, to the trampoline entry which is then going to call the ULP entry, which will modify the return address of the function that is being called. We'll uh, return to the, to the trampoline. The trampoline will go to foo, which will execute. And when it returns, it goes to the exit. And then from there, we will restore the original return address, which will go into the main function. So basically, it's, it's a trick to uh, have a track of if the function, if the library was entered or not. Okay, so we can do that. I mean, it works. But uh, what about threads? Well, uh, this shadow stack variable, it's, uh, it's a variable which is like uh, thread local storage. So basically, one thread is not interfering with the other one. So we basically can track this in a thread uh, granularity. It's, it's not a problem. And uh, how do we actually apply the patch, right? So I mean, we, we know that, uh, that the, the library was entered or not, but I mean, how do you do to apply the patch? So basically, we are going to use some ptrace for doing that. We have implemented this tool that we call uh, the trigger. The trigger is basically a tool which will get into your process and make it run a self-patching process. So let, let's see how it goes. First thing it will do, it will stop the process and ptrace into it. Then it will save the context uh, so it can restore the original context uh, afterward. It will, it will parse like all the needed information out of like the, the, the process image. So it will take, for example, the link map, the load biases. So we can actually understand uh, where, where things are inside that process. Then uh, it's going to redirect all threads into an infinite loop. So uh, basically what we're doing here is that we are just 
making the process uh, locked in a state that it's not going to harm itself if it, if it executes. Then we restart the process. Uh, after we restart the process, we go thread by thread, making that they do a self-check. So basically what we do is that we, we go into one thread, make it run a self-check function, which will basically return the, the, the value for that shadow stack uh, and let us know if that thread is consistent or, consistent or not. So basically we're going to do that uh, with every, every thread. And if uh, all threads are consistent, this means that uh, it's okay to, to apply the, the patch. And basically what we do is that we take one of these threads again, which are in the, in the infinite loop, and make them make it make this, this thread run the, the apply patch function. So basically the apply patch function we will use uh, we reuse the dynamic linker, right? I mean, it will just load a shared object into the memory of the process, and then we'll uh, modify the, the, its own memory as it's necessary. So uh, it's, it's, it's really interesting to do it like that because we can reuse the dynamic linker. We don't need to implement a dynamic link linker by ourselves. We don't have to deal with parsing and patching uh, memory, memory of a process. I mean, it would be like much more painful. Uh, here, we are just using uh, capabilities from glibc to, to, to do that. On top of this trigger, we have this that we call the dispatcher tool, which is a tool to make it easier to, to patch processes. This dispatcher tool basically sweeps through all processes. It will identify those processes that uh, are using the library, which uh, needs to be patched. And uh, if they were not patched, it will trigger the live patches into that given process. So it's basically a high level tool uh, for, for management. These live patches, which uh, we are basically using, they are composed of two main files, which are uh, a metadata file, just bringing the description of which functions must be replaced by which other functions, and a shared object, which is a regular shared object, uh, regularly compiled with GCC, no special uh, thing here, that brings the functions which will be used to replace the old functions. And uh, it is very easy to pack this with RPM, Basically, all that you have to put inside your RPM is to put the patching files into a predefined uh, directory. We are currently using var, ULP, and the, ID, the unique ID for, for a given uh, patch. And uh, then you just have to invoke the dispatcher tool, which takes care of finding whatever needs to be patched and patching it. Uh, some issues, of course. Uh, there are some issues that we still need to figure out. First of them are static functions. Our, our model currently uh, is not supporting static functions. So for example, if you have a function static uh, foo, this function is not an exported function, so it's not called through uh, dynamic symbol uh, reference or anything like that. But if eventually you have another function which is exported that leaks the address of foo, this means that foo can be reached uh, without going through uh, our, our, our gates. So basically uh, it would be able to run a foo without us getting track of it. So this is something that we are working on a solution. We already have some ideas, and hopefully we'll be able to fix it soon. Uh, another problem is that we currently use malloc and uh, libdl in the in the in libpoop. So this means that, for example, if malloc is being executed in the moment you ptrace inside the process and you reinvoke malloc from uh, from uh, our context by using ptrace and invoking the routines to apply the patch, it could lead to a deadlock. But this is also something that we are taking care of. Okay, now I'm going to do a very quick demo, just a small one. Uh, oh, actually, I have a description of the demo. Oh, it was fast. So we have this libdummy, which is just like an example library. It has two functions. One function is bar, which will print a message and then return. And we have this other function, which is sleeping bar, which will print sleep uh, for one second and then return. So uh, we have two different toy applications, the dummy app one, which will uh, call bar and then sleep for one second. And then we have the dummy app three, which will uh, call sleeping bar. So notice that the basic difference here is that the dummy app one is going to sleep outside the library, while dummy app three will sleep inside the library. So basically what we're trying to do here is to show that the consistency model uh, works and that uh, since uh, dummy app tree will be sleeping inside the context of the library, it should not be patched, right? So uh, dummy app one should, should work. I mean, we should be able to patch it, but dummy app tree should not be patchable because, I mean, there's like a tiny window of possibility, and since it's a live demo, it's probably gonna go wrong. But uh, if everything goes 
accordingly to all my tests, it will uh, be okay. But that's, let's not abuse luck. Okay, so uh, notice also that I did not uh, I did not statically link libpulp into into the binaries, so we can just like load that uh, using LD preload. So it's just going to be like uh, uh, loaded into the, the the process the process memory. And uh, this is dummy app one, and I'm going also to also run dummy app one. The, Three and one, that's that's what I meant. So basically we're just there like printing messages. And uh, simply by installing an RPM. We might be able to patch these guys. Okay, so as you can see, uh, libdem1 changed its message, so basically we replaced a function which was printing by a function that's now printing live patched, while the other process was not patched because it was sleeping inside the library, so it was not safe to patch it, so the dispatcher did not force it. So basically, uh, it, the dispatcher even gives you a, a line that you might be able to use to reapply the patch if, if that's what you want. Okay, that's pretty much what I had to show, and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. The ball. <laughs> uh, as, as to my understanding, uh, the user place live pitching uh, plays tricks with the stack, it places the return address on, on, on the stack, right? Sorry? Uh, it uh, adds, uh, it changes the stack frame uh, layout, right? Uh, okay. Uh, the current implementation. How does it play with the debuggers? Uh, okay, I haven't uh, really tried to debug it very much. I mean, of course, I had to debug my own bugs, uh, but I did not have much problem, to be honest. I mean. The biggest problems I had with debuggers were not exactly because of the stack layout, but because of signals. So uh, basically, I mean, when, when we were using ptrace, we were also placing uh, int tree instructions, which are the same instructions used by debuggers to get control back from whatever they're debugging. So this was like a little bit trickier to, to, to debug uh, in, in a sense. But uh, regarding the stack layout, it's interesting that this is the first question because one of the hardest to find bugs I had was that uh, uh, by doing the ptrace trick, I was uh, messing with the stack layout and I would go into uh, having a, a stack which was aligned to, to 8 bits and not 16. And uh, this would go against some instructions, uh, some specification, instruction specifications on Intel. But uh, eventually we just like made a, a quick assembly hack to, to make sure that the, the stacks are always aligned to 16. So. It's, it's kind of fixed. But uh, I think that when you mentioned debuggers, you're probably curious about uh, stack tracers themselves, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, ideally, uh, ideally they will, I, I don't really know, I have to test this, but I think that what, what's going to happen is that's gonna show that uh, it's returning, I mean, the, the, the function which is like below the function which is being called is going to be ULP exit and not, uh, and not the function which actually called that, but it's actually a good thing that we have Tom with us. He's going to uh, create a patch for GDB and make it work. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, some people over there. <laughs> right. Um, I noticed that um, you still had PLT and in. Uh, in the diagram that uh, that illustrates the current implementation, um, is that needed? I mean, if my application gets uh, the address of the of the target function through DLSIM, for example, uh, will it stop working with live patches, or is that not relevant? Uh, let me. You were talking about this. Uh, where is it? Yeah, it's many many slides back. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, I think I went too too much. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, yeah, this okay. one. It still includes the PLT, but I believe it should not really be important. Uh, or did I miss something? Uh, I, I did put the PLT here just to make it clear that uh, whenever this symbol has been resolved, I mean, it's just like a dynamic linked function. So whenever the symbol has been resolved, it's although it's like in the GOT, it's just reusing uh, the dynamic linker as it is in Linux today. Uh, but instead of like resolving it directly to foo, which would normally be the case, it will actually redirect to the trampoline entry. So uh, that's that's the thing. So if you are calling uh, foo without going through the PLT or without using the dynamic linking uh, somehow, just like uh, I showed with the with the static functions, then yeah, you have a problem with that. I mean, consistency is going to be broken. So uh, that, that's a thing which we want to fix, but uh, this, this is what we have currently. I mean, we, we are relying on uh, libraries being accessible through the PLT. I mean, uh, another solution to that would be just to emit uh, the functions with the stubs in their beginning and in their end, but then you will you will have like incredibly huge functions and this would be like much uglier. But you, you will get rid uh, of the problems of having to deal with dynamic linking and, uh, and these uh, corner cases. Um, so the, the PLT that is here shown is in the normal executable, which has nothing to do with, with patching. Um, so what, what, what is retargeted is actually the address of foo um, within the target library. So whenever you look up foo, then you find not the address of the real executable code of foo, but rather of the of the trampoline for foo, which means that DLSIM is working automatically. Uh, and the PLT is the PLT is shown here because this is how dynamic function calls are implemented in executables. That, that we are not patching PLTs now. We're patching the symbol table of the of the basically the shared library that we are patching is in the middle column, and it has a symbol table which normally connects the string foo with the label foo there at the right side. But what we are associating the string foo with ULP foo trampoline. Basically. And uh, how do you redirect foo to actually go to ULP exit? Because you didn't mention that this is doing so. Presumably it has to do something with the stack tricks that you're playing that Libor mentioned. Okay, so uh, at the ULP entry, do you see that there? Well, what we're doing is that we are actually changing the return address of the function there. So uh, whenever this function is returning, it's going to go to your exit. So uh, that's a trick. So I think we need a serious chat about your var ULP directory because that's neither FIS conform and will create trouble with rollback snapshots and everything else. <laughs> Thorsten, until, until two weeks ago, we had it all placed in temp. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, don't tell. It's as well as <laughs> we are very organized. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, until like two weeks ago, we, we did not have the dispatcher tool. I just like pushed everything to Michael and said, oh, take a look. And he's like, come on, man, scripts in temp? No, make it better. <laughs> and, and we went to, to making the dispatcher tool and fixing the directory there, but we might change it. It's, it's not fixed, of course. Is there a timeline when this is going to be available? Like generally available. A timeline? Uh, we're going to decide that in one hour. I mean, we have like a meeting right after the talk. So uh, possibly we're going to figure out something. I mean, we have to identify which are the requirements. I mean, which are the bad, the bad sides of the project as it is right now, how we have to fix it. And then we, we will probably be able to find a more realistic timeline. But currently we just say something along the first semester of next year. But uh, are you sure that you are not st will stumble over some blocks like endless running library functions or, or more static function pointers uh, passed out of the library that then are used by the main program and so? So are you sure you will get a 100% solution with like OpenSSL? Uh, no, I'm not sure because I did not try it yet. But uh, for example, I mean, we, we have been trying to map the corner cases as, as we did with the static functions. And uh, for that, we, we have a solution which we are currently thinking of, which is basically instrumenting the static, the static symbols by themselves. So we can just put the, the entry stub on, on the prologue of, of uh, this static function. So it would be similar. But uh, what we do currently is saying that we cannot support patching static functions. 
So, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a problem, right? So if you want to patch a static function, it might be running and we might not be aware of that. Uh, additionally, uh, if you have a static function being called by uh, a normal or regular function, then you know uh, that the library was entered. And even if you have like a static function calling a regular function, you again become aware of that because uh, calling exported symbols always go through the PLT. So it goes through the PLT even inside the library. And uh, you, you're going to be aware that the function is running. So uh, we just have to be a little bit careful with static symbols. We don't know about other cases where this would be a problem. And, uh, and, and that's the thing, actually. I mean, uh, the, the, the symbols, I mean, the symbols, they have to be resolved into the PLT entry. So it's going to use the dynamic symbol table. Otherwise, if you have, for example, uh, a function which is, which is uh, preloaded on, on, in front of the other one, uh, you're not going to call the, the right function inside your code. So this has to be done for the linker. This has to respect the symbol. So otherwise, uh, the, thing, the, 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 the dynamic link will be broken. So uh, we just trust that. We trust that uh, it, must, it must be resolved to the PLT entry when you are talking about exported symbols. OK. Hello. What about inline functions that are part of the library, but actually are Actually, the code or the assembly is uh, part of the binary. So uh, you're talking about uh, library functions which are inlined in the main object, yeah, or yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Okay, uh, yeah, I mean that's that's going to be a problem because you, we cannot patch the the main object uh, as it currently is. So uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, I have been discussing with uh, Nikolai yesterday regarding the per task model. Accordingly to him, it's it's not normally uh, really necessary. So uh, this is something that we might want to attack in the future, like finding ways to patch the main object, uh, which which uh, have like different assumptions or something like that. Maybe try to rely on a stack trace uh, for for given cases. Because I mean, if you if you have like a limited target, let's say you just want to stack trace the main application, it might be easier to to use something. I mean, instead of like having to rely on a stack tracer to uh, analyze the main application plus 1,000 libraries or something like that. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's something that we, we might want to, it's a feature that we, we might want to, to add in the future. And not only for static functions which are inlined there, but for uh, even for the application itself. I mean, there are still those 10% of bugs which are actually in the, in the, the main application. So yeah, it's, it's something that we want to add in the future. It's just like one step after the other one. And uh, another question, did you do some measurement over the overhead? Of uh, this? I did some measurement of overhead a long time ago when we were using the modified PLTs and it was really negligible. So uh, for this new model, we did not do it yet, but it's something which is definitely in our roadmap like for, for very soon. So uh, as, as Michael said uh, a few minutes ago, we, we were still implementing the, the basic things like the dispatcher thing and something that we could actually show and uh, having an RPM and I mean, actually would, would make this look good. And now we are, we are going to take a look at the measurement, see if we can optimize it somehow and things like that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Wojtek. Well, I would just like to say that the traditional way for patching the main object is to define a safe spot in it Eitherly by uh, either by like annotating it in the source code by just saying calling a function from your library that says now everything is safe we can exchange uh, functions. Sorry. Yeah, that's the initial model we had actually, and um, because we were focused on patching like applications, and if we again want to patch applications, we can just use that. So it's it's a functioning model. The other way actually, or the the model could be extended. Not by annotating it explicitly in the in the actual binary or in the source code of the, of, of the application, even, but uh, actually uh, taking a look where the application is currently sleeping, p tracing it, and having an analysis uh, that this point is the one that is safe. So basically, first taking a look at the uh, uh, so when a bug comes in in an application that has not been annotated, 
you just uh, take a look what is the main loop, decide what the safe point is, then you ptrace it, check if it's at the safe safe point, which it most of the time will be, uh, and then patch it. Yeah, uh, for, for ptrace, all, all that it takes is actually just placing the breakpoint in the right address. It's similar to a debugger. So if you if you know where the, the safe point is, you can just go there, place an int3 there, wait to the to the application gets there, it's gonna return control to the ptrace, and then you trigger the patch. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah, so you, you don't even need to to tailor the, the checkpoints in, in the application. It's it's much easier than that, actually. Yeah, you just you just need to analyze it like yeah. manually, making sure that it actually that point uh, satisfies all the requirements for it being a safe point. But after that, it's actually pretty trivial. So yeah. um Actually, one thing that I think we will need before we can make this like widely available is also to try to minimize the disruption this causes to the application execution. So um, the amount of time that we keep the application blocked. Um, is there a... Uh, so I suppose that the reason why you are currently stopping all the threads is that you are not doing... not currently able to do per thread uh, switch from one implementation to the other, right? So what the kernel does, it actually moves from the new function, or from old function to the new function per thread. So as the threads are exiting, uh, it, it changes the view of the function for each thread separately, and thus it doesn't have to stop any of the threads at all. I assume that you are currently doing it in one go for everybody. Uh, yeah, I mean uh, the, the the problem the problem with the threads uh, originally was at least in my mind was to uh, we don't want threads running and going into the code that we want to change uh, while we are still patching. So I mean the patching process is still a little bit complicated. We have to load like a shared object inside, resolve a lot of symbols, so it takes some time. So uh, all that we did not want at that moment was to prevent uh, a thread for, from entering and breaking consistency when we assumed that it was okay to 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 patch. Uh, it was like the the first the first uh, concern, right? So that is one thing that we should definitely take a look at: uh, how much we can minimize the amount of time that the application is actually being stopped. Yeah, yeah. Particularly, yeah. particularly if we rely on the, the the threads actually trying to all exit the library, that at the current time can be quite a long time. No, it's stopping. So, so it's it's stopping the threads checking, and if something didn't work, it's continuing with the threads. So it's it's like oh, I see. sub seconds. And then if it didn't work, you basically it's it's a policy thing about when to try again. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Anyone else? I could not call myself, but I think you have a bug. It should be RSP plus 16. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> should it? Well, when you do the call to EOP entry, it already pushes uh, the last PC, which would be EOP full TRM, right? So when you do the rate, you want to jump there, then do the jump full, and then you want the next thing on top of the stack to actually be the EOP exit. But doing red, it does a pop. Okay, makes sense. Anyone else? So thank you very much. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions or discuss different ideas. Uh, this is actually something that pushed us into these new ideas because uh, last, last, the last labs conference, we had the opportunity to discuss this with many people. So we got like many nice ideas and we were able to spot many flaws in our previous model. So uh, thank you to everybody who contributed, and I'll be very glad if you have ideas, if you can just shoot me a mail or find me in the corridor here. So I'll be in Prague uh, during the, from October to November, so it would be nice to also chat if anyone is interested on that. So thank you very much, and uh, that's it.